Okay, so and let me open my the problems we're going to be working with today as well. Okay. Let me just see if I have all my work in here. All right. So um, what we're going to do is um, I want to start just by this little review of terms. And the reason I want to do this is because when I was working stats, it, it was so easy to get tangled up in terms and symbols. So I just want to review this with you. So we know about variance. And so just imagine that you have two words or you have a symbol for exactly the same idea. So variance is exactly the same as S squared, the same as sigma squared, the same as standard deviation squared. And all it is, all the variance is, is the sum of squares divided by either degrees of freedom or by n. And so I just want you to get to just know that anytime you see this S squared, it means variance. They mean exactly the same thing, all right? And then we know that um, standard, I think I can adjust this here and write better. Standard deviation, we could express it as S. It means the same thing as sigma, means the same thing as standard deviation. So it's just the different words for the same concept. And of course, when we see the S, it means we've estimated or divided by degrees of freedom because we didn't know the for sure answer. If this, it's known for a population. And if it's standard deviation, it's calculated precisely for a sample. but it's the same concept. All right, a couple more terms to review. Let me check my notes here where I wrote down what I wanted to review. Um, we know that when we say deviation, we just mean the difference between a score a score, we'll name X, and a sample mean, M. And so we would just write X minus M. That's what a deviation is. We know when we use SS, we're referring to the sum of squared deviations. And we just identified what we meant by deviation. So again, all we're doing is summing up a whole bunch of squared of deviations that we've then squared. So just this little bit of a review here. And when we use the word difference, like we did in our like we did in our um, paired samples t-test, we just mean um, any score minus another score or any mean minus another mean. And so when our paired samples t-test, we did x2 minus x1, referring to scores. And in our work today, we're going to be doing mean 2 minus mean 1. Um, and so those are just what we mean by difference. And as you know, if we have a difference, let's say we calculate the difference. Let's say x2 is 3 and x1 is 2. We know 3 minus 2 equals 1. But we know that if we accidentally reversed it and we did two minus three, 
we get the same number, but with a negative sign. And so when you're calculating these differences, you have to be a little care, you have to be careful of the direction, but just so you know, if you err in, in the direction, the only difference is gonna be the negative sign. So it's gonna make a difference in the paired samples t-test, but you always have to think about what direction you've subtracted. The number will be the same, but the sign will be different. And so now just one more quick review on this variance standard deviation. If the variance, so first of all, the variance is S squared and the standard deviation is S. And so if S equals three, what does the variance equal? The variance in this case equals three times three, which equals nine. All right, next one I want you to answer. So just so you know this relationship, if we have S squared equals four, what does S equal? We have to be able to confidently go back and forth in these. And then we would have to go to the square root of four, which equals two. And by square root, we just mean the number that's multiplied by itself. And if you ever wonder why we call it square, maybe you were never exactly taught this directly, it's because of this. Let's picture three. Here's a set of three. If we turn this into a square, a bigger square with three in each column, we have nine. So we have three times three equals nine. So if we have nine and we need the square root of it, it's like we have to go back to what is just one column. And so conceptually, if you've never worked, if you were never taught in this way, that's all we mean when we square it, we're taking the number and turning it into a square with that dimension in both directions. So if I say the variance, the variance is four, that means that I have a square, a big square with four little squares in it. What's the square root? Well, we need to have two this way and two that way. So the square root is two. This is the root, these two, one column. And so just one more comment on this. I, would, I really want you to participate now. I'm not gonna provide the answers, but I will provide the, I will just say we have a variance now. Uh, let's start with this. Let's start with a standard deviation. We have a standard deviation of four. What is the variance going to be? And everyone type it in, please. Thank you, Kyle, Arthene. The variance of a standard deviation of four The variance equals four, excuse me. Now, what did I say? Standard deviation equals four. Thanks, Kiana. All right, and I see three answers, so I'll go on, but we just have 16. We have to take four times four. All right, so the reason I wanted to put that is I can just so much remember when I was just learning this and I would see S squared and I'm like, what am I supposed to square? And it would just, it wouldn't seem obvious to me that all this was, was another way of saying variance. And because I struggled with that, I assume at least one other person in here gets confused by all these terms and, and all this. And that's why I wanted to review that with you today. Um, so let's clear out the screen and go into our new content. I'm going to be mostly um, for today giving you a conceptual overview of what we call 
the independent samples t-test. Independent. And sometimes I just call it the independent t-test. And in order to get to this independent t-test, we're going to review where we've been and where we're going. And um, screen isn't working. Um, okay, so I have, I had this tech problem with this screen and I couldn't figure it out, but then I thought you weren't coming, so I didn't worry about it. Oh, oh no. Listen to you. Oh, I don't think that'll work very well. I have a hard time getting in. See all these IDs. Oh my word! Yeah, you have to use a lot of IDs to get in here. Um, this is this is sort of frustrating, and I just realized my phone isn't even in my purse. Um, so, but if you want to, would you do me a favor? And there's a phone number on here. Would you just call it and say the screen isn't turning on in 500? Um, I or or could I don't have my phone here, so I can't call them. It's just why I was running around trying to resolve this. And I'm going to just um, kind of um, maybe they'll come over and tell us what to do. Okay, I'm just going to keep going with our review for a minute here. So the very first thing we started out with was we had data, we had a sample. You just get that number on, I can speak to them. Just, just a minute or two here so we can get some tech up here to help us. Okay. Hello, um, we don't have any screen on in 500A in NHC, and I don't know how to get it to show up. The, the little screen where I can join a meeting is up, but not the big screen. It's just off. The big screen where I can zoom into a meeting, that nice new screen that's in the room, it's just off, and I don't know how to turn the power on. On the back or on the... Yep, I found it. I should be able to do it for me now. Thank you. Easy solution. All right, thank you everyone in the room for your patience. Um, I'm going to stop share for just a moment while I get the meeting info to log in in this classroom, and then I will be right back on. Sorry to take your time like this. Now, what is the info for our meeting? There we go. Nine four two eight four seven three. All right.
Uh, Ms. Russ, you're on mute. Is this working? No. Okay. We have to start over here. So I'm just going to erase this. So, um, okay. so again, we're working on the independent sample speed test. And I was attempting to review the history with you. And we just, I'm going to do this because it's really important to link this in to what we've already done. So we started out with a D test with N equals one. In that case, our sample had just one person in it. And we wanted to compare our sample score with a distribution that had a known mean and we used mu and it also had a known standard deviation and so we used sigma and that was a pretty easy nice comparison we just determined whether our sample score fell into a tail and if it did then we had a significant finding and then we had to go on and we did our z test with n greater than one. So we now had a sample that looked like this. And we needed to take, we needed to understand the characteristics of our sample. So we, this is maybe what it looked like. And we found the mean for this sample, maybe right here. And we compared our sample mean And we wanted to compare it with a distribution that had a known mean and a known standard deviation. But we knew that we couldn't compare a sample that had a group size greater than one with a population consisting of n equals one. So we had to do that little calculation to figure out the distribution of means. So in theory, we found a whole bunch of samples of the same size. So if this was n equals 10, then we drew a whole bunch of samples of n equals 10, and we calculated their means. We calculated their means. We didn't really do this, but this is the theory behind what we did. And after we did this, hundreds of times, in theory, we came up with the distribution of means. And that is just the distribution of all these means that we plotted onto this new graph. And so this new graph still had the same mean, but now we had a little bit new distribution. So this is the original data set for the distribution of individuals. And now we were using this little distribution consisting of these means. And we compared our sample with this. And we looked at this distribution to see if 
this was in the tail. And we did this a fairly straightforward way. All we did was take the variance of this distribution and we divided by 10. And that gave us the variance for the distribution of means. And we could, of course, take the standard deviation of that by taking the square root. So for our S, distribution of means, we just had the square root of that variance of distribution of means. And then we, so the only thing that we did different here was right here. We used this distribution of means. So that one was changed. So then we went on to our third test, and this was a T test. And henceforth, everything we have is going to have n greater than one. So I'm not even going to repeat it. And so in this case, our sample looked just the same. It was sample greater than one, all of these x's. And the first t test we did, by the way, was the one sample. And we figured out its characteristic. So maybe this was the mean. And we figured out the mean for our sample. But we had a little bit of a problem over here because we still had this population. And our population had a known mean. But the problem that we ran into is that it had an unknown, this is what was different, standard deviation. And so we had to add a step. We had to add a step of using the information from our sample to find out about the distribution for our population. So at this step, we first off took information from our sample. We calculated the sum of squares. In other, in other words, we looked at this distance, what kind of a spread were we seeing in our sample? We calculated the sum of squares, and we used this sum of squares to estimate the variance. And the formula that we used was just sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom. After that, we went on and we did just the same thing we'd done before. We drew, hypothetically, we drew out a bunch of samples of that same size, we calculated the means, and we plotted them into the distribution of means. We just did this before. The original distribution was here, so that was narrower. And so here's our distribution of means, just like we did up above. And we compared our sample mean with this distribution of means. And this distribution of means was using our estimated uh, standard deviation or variance. The standard deviation for the distribution of means was the square root of that estimated variance divided by 10. So that's the only difference that we had in here is that we were estimating. So we added one step. Next, we went on in our 7B unit and we used the t-test, same thing, but we used paired samples. And so in this case, our data looked a little bit different. So our raw data Instead of being just x, it was something like this, x1, x2, that's our first pair, that's pair one. x1, x2, there's our second pair. x1, x2, there's our third pair. Every score had a partner. And that partner might be, say, a natural relationship, or it might be a before-after score, but every score had a partner. And we couldn't use this just the way it is in a t-test. So instead, we calculated the different scores. For each pair, 
we took and subtracted x2 minus x1. And we got the difference for for pair one. And then we calculated x2 minus x1 for pair two. And we got the difference for for pair two. And we calculated x2 minus x1 for pair three. And we got the difference score for pair three. And we continued to do this. And once we got done with this, that was the new step we added. And then we did a little bit more because what were we comparing it to? Well, we were comparing it to a hypothetical. So here is our population. But we were comparing it to a hypothetical population where we had drawn out samples, hypothetically, and took two people out and took one score away from another score. This is the hypothetical distribution. We did this, draw two more, calculate x2 minus x1. We draw two more, we calculate x2 minus x1. And we do this over and over again. And we discovered that when we averaged out all of those different scores, that the mean was zero. That some of them x2 was bigger than x1, some of them x2 was smaller than x1, and when we averaged them all out, they come to zero. So that's the hypothetical distribution that we used. We still didn't know the spread of that distribution. So we had an unknown standard deviation. And so here we did just what we had done before. We calculated the mean for all of these different scores. So we took the mean difference. And that was going to be what we were comparing it to. And then we figured out the sum of squares. That is, we took these different scores and here's our sample. Our sample now, let's put it over here. Our sample now consists of all of these different scores. We figured out the mean for these different scores. We named it mean difference. And then we figured out the distance of each score from the mean or the deviation. And with that, we calculated the sum of squares. And then we did as we did before. We used this sum of squares to determine the spread for the distribution of means. So we estimated the variance using SS divided by PF to get S squared. And after that, we did just what we had been doing before. So this really isn't a new step right here. So I might even just circle this in blue because we did this in the one sample t-test. We did this before too. We calculated the distribution of means by taking out, well, how many different scores do we have? If we have 10, then we need to draw out sample size 10. And we'll create the distribution of means. And we know that we're still gonna have a mean of zero. The spread, we've estimated based on this estimated standard deviation. So we're going to take S equals the square root of the variance divided by N. And of course, our original distribution of different scores is right here. And that's how we solved this problem. We compared this distribution to this. And that's where you were this last time. That's what you were doing. You were looking in the tails of this little distribution, but the only new step you really added was using the difference scores. So that's where we are today. So that's the story of how we got here. I'd like to hear any comments or questions or like, oh my gosh, this was horrible or anything that I can look at now. 
um, in terms of how you are understanding all of this. Just typing in the chat. All right, and if I can just hear from someone that you either have a question or you have no question or you're totally lost, just jot something in here for me. Uh, how does that story tell for you, uh, uh, Doris? I need to uh, go back and catch up a little bit. Yeah, that's all right, you'll get there. Our team, thank you for answering. Can I hear from anyone else, please? I don't know that I understand. Okay. So I'm hearing from nobody, and this is hard for me. So um, I wish I could hear from someone. How about just one or two more people? can text directly to me if that's comfortable for you. Sixana, how is that for you? Did it make it better or worse? I feel like nobody can hear me. Ashley? Thank you, Arvine, um, again. Ashley, thank you, I hope it makes sense. Yolanda. Kiana, is there something about my voice that you can't hear or is it your own situation? Okay, um, so if you're in a situation where you're trying to attend class and it doesn't, it's not a good time for you because you have your children around or whatever, or you're at work, you can just, you can just watch this later. I'll record it. In fact, usually what I do is I record a better version of it at home, a version that doesn't have sort of the hiccups. Um, okay, thank you. A, a version that doesn't have as many hiccups. And so in that case, um, you know, you can just watch it later. So if this is not a good time, sometimes you can let me know. All right, well, I am gonna try to go on. Thanks for those of you who responded. Um, so let's go on now and look at our independent samples t-test. Um, so the question that we're gonna work with is um, this. So I'm going to look at, just see where I have it. Okay. So I look at does body awareness differ between pregnant women Okay, so this is the question we're going to work with. So in independent samples, um, what we're doing is All right, so 
So this is the question we're going to ask. Does body awareness differ between pregnant women randomly assigned to a gentle yoga class and those assigned to a gentle twerk or exercise class? And so this is the question I'm working with. And the, the thing that makes this an independent samples t-test is that is that it's not the same women in both groups. It's that we have different women in each group. So some pregnant women are taking this gentle yoga class and others are taking this gentle floor exercise class. So it's not like the paired samples where we had one woman first doing the yoga and then doing the floor exercise. These are different women. And that's why these samples are independent and why we're doing this independent samples t-test because these are two separate groups of women. Get my screen adjusted properly again. So again, the independent samples, the samples are independent of each other. No one in the gentle yoga class has any particular connection to anyone in the, in the gentle floor exercise class. So that's why they're independent samples. And so what we're going to do as we imagine this situation is we're going to imagine now, first off, let's write out our population. So in this example, our population of interest we'll call the yoga and in population two, we'll call the floor exercise. And what are we measuring in these women? What do you see as the dependent variable? You can type it in or speak it. What's being measured in this example? Anyone see what that is? Thanks, Ashley. Yes, body awareness. That's the dependent variable. Body awareness. And so let's imagine that our, po our big population our overall population from which we're drawing individuals is a population of all pregnant women. And this distribution refers to that every single one of those pregnant women has some sort of body awareness, either high or low. And if we took a body awareness measure from every pregnant woman in the world, we would get a distribution that looks like this. So this is our hypothetical distribution. And from this distribution, we're going to draw a certain number of participants. In this example that I'm going to use with you today, we're going to draw 10 participants. So a big bubble of 10 participants. And we're going to randomly assign half of them to be in one condition and half this time I'll write 0.5 half will be in the other condition. So we have all these women drawn out of this hypothetical population of all pregnant women drawn at random. And then we've divided them randomly in these two groups and half of them are in the yoga condition related to population one half are in the floor exercise 
condition related to population two. And so what we're gonna do is we figure out some of the characteristics of each sample. So each characteristic would have a certain number of individuals. In fact, we know that it has n equals five. We can count. We know that this, this particular sample has degrees of freedom equal to four because n minus one. If we had the scores written down, we could figure out the mean. If we had the scores written down, we could figure out the sum of squares. If we had the scores written down for each woman, we could figure out the variance. And we could do the same for population two. What do we know about? Well, we know n equals five. We know degrees of freedom equals four. We could figure out the m all the scores divided by n. We could figure out the sum of squares. I'll write n2, I'll write c for all of these, equals the sum of x minus m2 divided by n. We know that the variance is the sum of squares for population two divided by the degrees of freedom for population two. So we could do all of that. We could have a whole bunch of information about it. So you might be asking then, what is it that we're actually trying to figure out? Well, we know that population one is represented by this sample whatever their scores are, and this sample has a mean, mean one, we'll call it. We know that this has a distribution. It has a mean, mean two. We know we can learn something about these deviations. We can figure out the sum of squares. We know we can do the same for here. And what we're really looking for, the question that we're asking, is the big question, I guess, does M1 minus M2 differ significantly from zero? Is there a difference between mean one and mean two? That's what we're looking for. So our hypothetical comparison distribution is something like this. Like what you'd have to imagine, this is hypothetical, you're not gonna actually do this, but hypothetically, let's make it in some really, um, maybe if we could get some really kind of far out color, here we go, we'll use rainbow colors to show that we're not really gonna do this. Um, but what we would do if we were going to figure out what our comparison distribution is, is we would have to draw out a whole bunch of samples, an endless number of samples, just as we did here, and we'd have to divide this sample randomly into one group and the rest of them into another group, and we'd have to take mean one minus mean two, and then we would have the difference between those two means. And then we would have to plot that. Then we would have to do it again. We'd have to draw another sample, randomly assign one of them to group one and the rest of them to group two, take mean one minus mean two to get a different score. We'd have to do it again and again and hundreds and hundreds of times. And if we did this that many times and we plotted all of the different scores, we would get a distribution that has a mean of zero. Because some of the differences, in some cases, the body awareness of the first group 
would be higher than the body awareness of the second group. In some cases, the body awareness of the first group would be lower than the body awareness of the second group. And so if you plotted all of those mean differences, you would get a normally shaped distribution with a mean of zero. And so that's the comparison distribution. It is the distribution of different scores that have a mean of zero. So this is what we're asking. This is our question. So we have to do a little bit of a process to get the answer to it. What we're going to actually do then is take that hypothetical distribution of different scores that has a mean of zero. And we're going to realize that unfortunately we don't know the spread. And so we're gonna be estimating the spread much as we did before, but we're actually going to be doing it by taking advantage of the information from both samples. So we're going to start by figuring out something we call the pooled variance. We're gonna take information from both. Let me use a different color here to make clear. And we'll work this out with numbers in the end. And we'll just take it to be the average of the um, two variances. And so let's take the sum of variance one plus variance two equals the pooled variance. And then we know just 